Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Questioning a better way, one gracefully disruptive conversation at a time. Welcome to Turmeric and Tequila. We are live in Denver, Colorado. I'm super excited to have some Colorado notables in the house. Amanda Corrales, welcome to Turmeric and Tequila. Thank you so much for having me. Yes. I'm really excited. We're excited to be here. So we focus on Turmeric and Tequila about mental health, community, culture, and art. I saw Amanda's Instagram. I can't remember how, but I'm like, I love what she's doing. We got to get her out here. I don't always read the bio, but I'm going to because I want our everybody, but particularly our Colorado humans to go check out what she's going on. We think creative uh, community and the ability to create really does save lives. So this is the 411 on Amanda. She is the founder and executive director of Avant Garde. She is a visionary leader dedicated to supporting Colorado's emerging artists with a deep understanding of the challenges artists face in achieving financial stability and creative fulfillment. She established Avant Garde to combat economic insecurity and mental health pressures in the artistic community. Under her leadership, the organization focuses on dismantling financial barriers and fostering a thriving artistic ecosystem. Her efforts are crucial in enhancing Colorado's cultural landscape and contributing significantly to the state's $2.6 billion arts and culture sector. Amanda's commitment to expanding the organization's reach includes forming strategic partnerships and engaging with local businesses, thereby making art more accessible and enhancing the community's cultural vibrancy. Let's go, girl. That's a lot. Oh my gosh. Thank you for reading that entire thing. Oh my gosh. Uh, it, it was really nice to hear that. Um, sometimes I forget what I'm doing. <laughs> yeah, it, it is actually a phenomenal exercise. If you're at home, go back home and reread like your LinkedIn bio or something somewhere. Cause I think as we get older, we get thick in the thick of things and day to day, you know, runs from one to the next. We forget all the stuff we've done. So I think it's always yeah. a good practice to watch the guests. I'll rewatch it back. Obviously not what I'm reading, uh, to see how they, hear what I'm saying and they're like, oh, you can see a little like shoulders yeah, perk up like, and you're oh, like, I know that's I, right. I, I'm doing that? Oh my God. Yes. <laughs> well, so before we get into the business, uh, art and creativity, I really do think is a massive conversation. It's overlooked. We're losing budget in school. So these are like some of the first things cut. And this is like what I really believe our kiddos need. Before we get to that, tell us about young Amanda. Like what was the vibe as a young human? Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> I just remembered the other day that I was really into Hot Wheels. Oh, yeah. You okay. know, the like different designs, yeah. the different like formats of and styles of cars. 90s kids. Yeah, 90s kids. Sega. Oh, yeah. Sega was really into yep. it. Um, you know, a lot of pop culture, 90s, right? Yeah. So um, definitely like the uh, reading the tabloids. I think that was a big thing. The, the magazine. star, the sun, Ooh, 17 magazine. I remember that. that was, and actually, I always slip to the back to like the real stories. Oh, no, it was like, the w- you, like what happened when like the grossest stories, like a makeout oh, session. And the most this embarrassing happened. date moment yes. or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, Should yeah, we have been reading that? Fun. <laughs> like, I think we might have been cool. too young. I don't know. Well, uh, I wonder if we can find like some vintage 17 magazines and like go yeah. through the embarrassing moments. I'm guessing they're wildly not <laughs> PC at this day and age, but 17, you better be yeah, locking wonder. those up. 90s is probably not that PC. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> probably not in a 17. Ma- it's kind of weird that they had a magazine geared to 17 year olds that then talked about like dating. and. Well, like- the target market was probably like 12 to 13. Like, yeah, I, don't, I wasn't yeah, 17 totally. reading that. I was no, for was sure 12, like a new teenager. 13, yeah, for sure. Yeah. Interesting. Anyways, that was the 90s. Uh, Young Amanda. So that's where she grew up, you know, like doing a little like matchbox playing on the sidewalk kind of thing. But And you're born and raised Colorado kid. Oh, yeah. 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 We go camping. Yes. All that. Yeah. I know how to start a fire. That's what's um, up. Safely. Safely. Um, all these like fire restrictions these days. Um, but no, you know, my parents, my sister, we were all really engaged in the arts. DCPA, you know, I I hope I would hope uh, DPS still takes kids to go see like Dracula, the ballet, um, you know, Denver itself was just so engulfed in the arts. It was hard not to be exposed to that and okay. somehow be involved in that. Mm-hmm. Um, both my parents were DPS teachers. You know, I think a lot of the resources that were available to us back then really engaged kids in the arts, reading. Um, 
at the library, I think they still do it where you read a list of books and they give you tickets to the DCPA. Really? Or, Wait, libraries still exist? I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> I, mean, I feel like nobody goes well, to the library. But anyways, <laughs> no shade to the libraries. Go go read books, y'all. But uh, the, the downtown one, the, okay. they would do like these little kids uh, come in and say like, oh, I read this book, read this book. They give them tickets? To like Elitch Gardens. Oh, cool. Wait, what is it called now? Uh, Six Flags? No, it's not Six Flags. I don't know. Is it back to Elitch Gardens? I think it's Six Flags. Elitch Gardens. Six Flags at Elitch Gardens? Yeah. I don't know. It's our main thing. I don't know. Part, if but you know, that you know. place. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but That's yeah. cool. And so they did some of those to the arts? Yeah. Like to... Yeah, like it, it was a lot of Maybe I didn't read the books. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, that's um, cool. So we did that, you know. Uh, Denver's just really engulfed in the arts, which is also why I do I do what I do. Yeah. Um, because it's really it was really hard for me uh, to really apply myself into a position of income in the arts. Were you so? Were you like a painter, an artist, or anything? Were you trying to monetize? That well, so I went to photo- I went. I have a bachelor's in the arts. Okay, uh, majored in photography, and you know that's. It was at a time where like digital cameras on your cell phone was yeah. in the rise. Yeah, and that really hurt. I think photographers because we weren't paid enough. The market value went down, but uh, there's just a surplus of artists here mm-hmm. that I'm not sure there's really a, a good put in place system for them to actually have full-time income right if that makes sense I, well i think it's funny because i think the creative scene is much like the athletic scene like all these niche spaces where you've got your passion and you want to make it a thing you have deep credentials degrees experience whatever but then your the passion is one thing you always have to know the business side and right. for creatives just like athletes or the fitness industry you can be a great athlete a great coach it doesn't necessarily mean you know how to run a business and that's really hard i face that coming out of college being an entrepreneur thankfully most of my classes were um within the business realm of economics and whatnot at george mason uh so i had some game but you don't learn a lot until you fail a lot and there was no group right. that i found that could help out so i can see how you're good at your passion but you still have to know the business piece yeah um so i do have uh, a degree but not a business degree, right. which would take another, you know, X amount of years. And so without making income, right. right? So I think going to school for the arts is great. Internships, great. But, you know, you got to pay bills at some point. Mm-hmm. And getting out of college, six months later, I had a $500 bill in my uh, school loans. Mm-hmm. So it was really hard to get to a place where that was feasible. Mm-hmm. Um, but what I did do is real life experience. Yep. And I went through, you know, gaining HR experience on how to actually navigate the employment system. Um, I was in the banking system. So I learned a little bit about finance loans, how those can actually help you to, you know, use it as a stepping stone to get to the next spot. You know, I've been, zero out of debt i think just oh just a mortgage um and you know it's it was actually a little unbelievable that i was out of debt um but it is possible to be able to maneuver the financial system to benefit your and further your business I mean, that's probably a whole podcast in itself, but do you have like quick tips on if someone's listening and they're like, I am an artist or an athlete or whatever, but I'm trying to monetize my passion as far as getting more um, education or skills or knowledge around the financial system, steps that they can do to do that? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Your bank always has financial resources to learn about, you know, the credit system or what they can offer you, any grant or funding opportunities, you know, look at interest rates, look at, you know, if you have a little bit of money, uh, put it away and earn, make that money, make money for you. Mm -hmm. Um, There's, there's increment ways, but every penny really counts. Yeah. You know, um, Rich people stay rich because they count their pennies. For sure. So, you know, I always use little opportunities to make sure that I'm earning money in those little pockets. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, Like what's an example that you take advantage of? 
Oh my gosh. Uh, well, definitely my interest rate on my bank account is like a 0.25, which is pretty high, but I shopped around and made sure I got a pretty good interest rate. So I make like a couple bucks a month just with my savings account. Okay. Um, and that's like only $2, but I mean, you, you spend that pretty easily. Yeah. Well, but it offsets inflation a little bit if it's sitting yeah. there slightly. Um, um, but I'm it trying matters. to think what else. There's a... Uh, there are some other things that I do, but I can't think of, yeah, yeah, I know. Okay. I'm like, what? <laughs> well, this do isn't I do the point of the conversation. Money? But I think even just people knowing that you can go to your local bank, or, where you're already a client, like your money's already there. So just find out what they can offer you and what they can do. Also, though, with assistance programs, you know, those are for everybody. And if you are actually under assistant programs, qualifying, like yeah. reach out for those resources. Those resources are going to save you money in the long run. It may not be cash. Yeah. But it's actually time and time is a lot more money. Yeah. Than cash itself. So what's like an example of that? Um, well, uh, let's see, because of the fact that I'm not making any income as a self-employed entrepreneur for this month yeah. i'm not taking in any revenue i'm looking for resources that are looking for someone who has no income okay um okay. and so right now i'm going i'm going through the process of getting like a mortgage payment oh okay that's worth a lot of money yeah, um, yeah. and if you put in the time a mortgage payment is 15 plus hundred you yeah. know dollars depending on how much they're willing to assist you for that month okay um you know things like that yeah i know that sounds like oh i have no money but it's really just me tapping into my community re resources right. to make sure that we're cultivating the community member you know that's how i see it well it's that's like, what they're okay. there for i mean that's literally what it's there for you, and you have to reach out it's not an easy process but it is something that you can qualify for as an artist if you don't make revenue for the for two months but then you know you've got your bills paid for those two months and you know really it's all about reading yeah that it's all in the details really right. um also you want to make i think um one of the things that I've learned recently, and it's not necessarily a financial tip, but look the part, right? So okay. like how much money do you want to make? You need to look like you're making that much money right now. Okay. And that puts you in a winner's mindset. Does this right? look like a billionaire's outfit? <laughs> <laughs> oh On the spot. <laughs> I'm like, oh, kind of. Like, I it's... walked in here with these, like, little heels and stuff. And, you know, my, you know, I have, like, makeup done and my hair. Yeah, yeah. I would say I want to, I, I need a better haircut. I need a million, like, Girl, dollar you look great. haircut. Yeah. No, I mean, what does um, a million dollar haircut look like? <laughs> I mean... Trust me. It's, it's pedigree, right? Like, it's very... You know, eyebrows, uh, yeah. everything. You yeah. want to make sure and we're not perfect. Like I, I'm sure uh, I've got a chip here on my nail, but I mean, Justin Bieber looks like a slob. <laughs> no shade to him, but like, <laughs> oh, I'm sure, I'm sure. But he's already having the money. You're right. You're right. Yeah. You're you right. know, he yeah. doesn't need the winner's mindset. Yeah. He already's got it. He doesn't need good clothes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe some other. We can send him power vibes for other reasons. Yeah, but, he might need yeah. some like healthy food or something yeah. that might make him feel better. Well, I, I completely agree because I'm about the X's and the O's and numbers entrepreneurship. Or you got to have that stuff dialed in. The flip side is the mindset. And you really do yeah. have to foresee. I'm very big on manifesting and uh, mental focus, breath work, all that stuff. But really getting clear on what you want and then really doing everything you can to get towards that. And I was actually better at that as a young human. I wanted to play D1 lacrosse. Coming from Colorado, we're not known to play lacrosse. My coach played softball. Like, we didn't have it. But I was so focused on what I wanted to do. And I didn't know that this was a skill set at the time, but I literally lean into that young version of myself or like where there was no gray area. Like this is what yeah. we're doing. I, I had totally naive on how it was going to happen, budget, ability, <laughs> skills, all of it. However, it, it worked. It happened. So I, I think the mindset is often overlooked on how important it is in feeling like a million dollars or a billion dollars and being the top podcast in the game or being, you know, the number one nonprofit in Denver. Right. Like that stuff really plays a huge role in it because if you don't believe it, no one else will. Well, all these systems that we're trying to get integrated in, all of the the uh, formats of people's lives, whether it's a billionaire, millionaire, mm -hmm. whatever, We've created that process as humans. So for us to believe that we can't recreate that with each and every individual, that's 
that's the you in your own way. 100%. Connect. So I think we've talked about this on our initial call, like philosophy. We won't go down that rabbit hole, but reality is nothing more than applied meaning. So I tell our young people, right. like, take a load off. This shit's all made up. Like, whatever winging you want it. to think. I'm winging it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, even the top people are like, you know, and the landscape of the digital world and AI and all this, totally. they don't know. We don't know. Like, we literally don't know. Like, we're There's so many territory. brand new uh, technologies, yeah. gadgets, platforms. The information out there is rapidly increasing that I think everyone is starting to become on the same level. Everyone is... Well, there's an accessibility situation, which is good. Right. Um, and then I think it becomes more of like a parental thing. It's like, how young do you want your young humans to have access to all this? Because then that's oh when gosh. I think access is a whole thing. But we won't go down that rabbit hole either. So you get out of college. You have this passion for arts. You go into more of the mainstream system to pay bills, which I think most of our young people do. Lots of kids are moving home just to make it work, which I get. Uh, what was your what was the light switch where you're like, I'm going to take on this nonprofit, start it and just blaze trail because that's a really hard pivot into a really hard situation especially in denver colorado yeah um you know i i've been in the workforce since i was 15 years old i i finally took this nonprofit full-time you know four or five months ago so in between that um i gained a lot of skills and i would say one of the places that i ended up in is the first nonprofit I worked in, Entrepreneurs Organization, worked with a lot of, um, you know, generating a million dollar revenue entrepreneurs and getting to know how they are able to further their knowledge, not just their education, because it's not really education at that point. It's really experience and sharing and gaining other people's perspective on how to create solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and I just thought, well, what do I love, you know, the most? And how can I find something to do with longevity? So the arts was definitely my answer. And the next thing was, how can I apply this to that? Did you have like a mental health shift when you were in or these corporate situations that weren't necessarily like feeding the soul? Like, did you notice a shift in your own personal experience? Um, yes and no. Okay. I enjoyed being in that position because it allowed me to live my life, mm -hmm. uh, my own personal life and evolve as an actual personal human being. And, you know, it there's a huge difference in who you are under pressure versus who you are when you're allowed to have that space to breathe and yeah. take a moment to just be still. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> somehow this job like allowed me to do that for a moment. And I just knew with all of the mindset that I was influenced by all these people that just were like already doing it. Mm -hmm. and, and these people were also struggling to delegate their work to fully embrace living their own life as the creator of this, you know, million dollar company. I mean, the whole point of doing that is to be able to just have the money and live your life and go and be right. Yeah. yeah. And they were actually really struggling to do that, to let go, let the control go. And so this was a place for them to learn how to do that. Right. And so I felt like I was kind of learning in reverse what this is like the entrepreneurial job you worked at. Okay. Yeah. Um, I felt like I was seeing and learning in reverse what yeah. I'm now creating for artists. I love it. So okay. I can see the end game. Um, and I, I've lived the end game. I just want to do it with like my people. 100%. <laughs> yeah. hundred percent. Well, tell, what, is, what is my people to you? Well, artists, creators, yeah. visionaries, creators, yeah. people on the ground level, yeah. like your neighbor, you know, the people that you grow up with yeah. um your community yeah 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 I, that. I think it's really good i like the term you used um or the word pressure because i think we're so adverse to letting our young people feel that pressure and to me especially as an athlete i think it's the best thing you can learn in the world because diamonds form under pressure all totally. the cliches the reality is life's going to get really hard whether you're prepared or not so if you're not prepared for that finance forget about it like whatever when you start dating family and health and some of this like larger stuff in life you've got to feel that pressure and i think it's okay to chase the passion but as a young person coming out of college you don't get to pick the dream you need to go do the work you got to do the stuff and i would have i liked that i started as an entrepreneur 
entrepreneur right out of college because I didn't, I had five years, redshirt ACL, you know, top 20 D1 athlete, blah, blah, blah. I was done having a boss. And so I was like, whatever it's going to do as an entrepreneur, we're going to figure out. However, I wouldn't change anything. But having taken that time to just go get a, a job, a regular job and get a financial cushion and then go chase the dream and build that, it, we would have jumped through way less holes. But again, the pressure was good for me and we're a masochist. So that's a whole other thing. Uh, but I think it's okay if you don't have to chase the dream right away. Go get your ducks in a no, row. You have pay time. the bills. We, have, yeah. we all have time to do what we're Learn trying stuff, to do. Make you know, some friends. Yeah. yeah. There's plenty of time to do what we want to do. Right. Um, we just have to actually do it. Or keep it in the back pocket. And that's why I spent the mental yeah. health. You can do the traditional thing and still facilitate art or creativity or athletics in your Absolutely. life. Yeah. And then work towards it and know that it's there. So you don't have to shift. You don't have to cut it off. Just create space intentionally for it. That space, though, that's all part of the process. Totally. You know, so like there's a lot of things on my list that I'm doing right now. Mm -hmm. Am I physically out, out putting it into writing or a physical manifestation? No. <laughs> okay. No. But every artist knows that a lot of the work happens up here. Yeah. So, you know, don't be so hard on yourself if it hasn't physically manifested into, you know, a book, a product, uh, whatever it is that you're after. But we still have time, you know? Well, also a deep awakening. I don't know if you experience this. You can do everything right. You can put in all the things, which you never really are. But in your mind— do it all right, and yeah. it's still not time. Like, you don't really have control over your timeline and whatever you believe. I say God, universe, Madonna, wh whatever it is, there is, a t like, divine timing for things. Yeah. And sometimes you just have to stay in it, keep showing up, keep the practicing, keep the faith. And when it's time, it will happen. So you, you kind of yeah. have to let go a little bit. Are you good with that? Yeah, absolutely. Oh, okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm totally— um, uh, honing that right now. Okay. How'd you, know? you get that skill set? Uh, I don't think it's a skill set. It's a mindset oh. for sure. Okay. I think it's, you know, um, a mindset of growth, a mindset of abundance. Um, where'd you get that language? Like, where does that stem from? Those three years, man. Yeah, that's what's up. Okay. Um, Warren Russin. I don't know. I could start like spewing names, but it's just, you know, I, I don't know how or when or why I was ever in a mindset of scarcity. Yeah. Um, a lot of it's generational narrative. Absolutely. And and I'm definitely trying my best. That, I mean, that's uh, something I'm doing, right, sure. is breaking those generational cycles. and Which is something we all have to do regardless of what the topic is. Absolutely. And it starts with your language. It starts then when, when you regurgitate that. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, I just I think it's it's a process. I mean, therapy. OK, therapy yeah. uh, has absolutely led me to this kind of language. Yeah. Um, but I'm really into science. OK, <laughs> I love it. This is like the woo and the like turmeric and tequila laid out there. Uh, really into Two science, like brain science. Yeah, yeah, you know, and getting to know myself. I think it almost started from like a Myers-Briggs test. Oh, OK. You like know? in school or something? Uh, at a job. Oh, at one of my jobs. You know, I did. You know, I've I've had a lot of jobs. I've so been. your career's really pulled you through. Yeah, mine, mine was more athletics, but I like that. I think uh, it finds a way. Well, you know, I've been a gym and dance coach. I've been a bank teller. I've been um a like a leasing agent. I've been um oh my gosh, HR like resource. You know, manager. Uh, I've been a lot of different things, but I've picked up a lot of different like life skills and just applied it and adapted it differently to what I needed to use it for. Um, but, you know, uh, now I now I'm lost. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm just I just I think it's funny. how There's always a through line to stuff. So, again, letting go of timing, let it going, letting go of like a plan. I think you got to be intentional with what you want. You really got to know that like your education might not come from your actual education it might come through your career. It might come through this. I'm just no. always fascinated when uh, people kind of have this flip of like. When, oh, I can change my mindset or I can control my thoughts or I can, you know, change my generational narrative. I'm, yeah. and, and I'm like, is that from family? Is that within? It sounds like it was kind of always within you. I think it, I think it is. I yeah. think if we as human beings, and this is kind of a new like come to, but I think as human beings, if we can intuitively follow our like 
you know, one part of it is a fight or flight or an intuition or your gut or those animal instincts that we're born with yeah. as one of the most intelligent species on this planet. Why don't we use our instincts more? I think we just numb out. I think we're taught to numb out. And I, levels. I think that if we in, tuned ourselves into that a little bit more and really like just let it all go, like mm -hmm. stop using your brain. Your brain is a muscle and yes, it talks to you <laughs> and like it gives you thoughts, ideas and all of that. But at the same time, I think we have gotten lost in letting allowing that to control what our decisions what we should be doing, how we should be doing it. Our brain is a muscle and we need to really like detach from that and, the, and not, not like give it so much power over us yeah. and really trust that our instincts, our gut feelings are what should be a very heavy decision maker on guiding us and where we should be going. Um, I don't find energy in things I don't want to be doing. And I think there's a reason for that. Absolutely. This, I, I'm so like, like crack down a little bit <laughs> or like you know hyped up or you know sugared out or whatever you want to call it um when i work on avant-garde i ha i could go for hours at a time yeah whereas anything else i've been doing or you know i don't i don't try to gravitate towards things that feel really heavy or like yeah. consume my energy so much i try to w work on things that make me feel high or like joy and yeah happiness. like it's it's wild sometimes i can't come down after after like a conversation <laughs> like this um because i get so excited it's such an innate thing and even the events that we're doing and the ideas that i've come up with sometimes i'm like i don't know but i passionately am behind it yeah 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 you're just it, following the, the vibe great I and mean, that's i talk i get so hyped about this i try and be like and not talk so fast yeah. but then i'm just like just slow it down when you listen to it back like you can control the speed because yeah. the energy is real like when you're in it you're sure. in it and when you're in the flow you know but it's pretty hard to like let go of that because we are taught so much to like disconnect compute the answer do what you're supposed to Logic. do follow status quo did it and it's like but that's when you start to get the mental health discrepancies and you're unhappy and it's so funny that as a kid, as a young human, you have this intuition and you got to take all these classes, read all these books, self-help, pay for all this therapy just to get right back to where you started. Right. But <laughs> it is what it is. <laughs> it's so it is. It's so important to have. I mean, as an adult, as a kid, I was like, why are we in school? Yeah. What is this hellhole? Yeah. But like I, I realize as an adult, we do need foundation. Foundation is so important. Yeah. And, you know. I probably didn't get the best education, but I got enough to keep me going and finding and and like fishing on my own. Yeah. You know, and so I I get it <laughs> now. Uh, I'm not a good student at all, but um, we well, just learned in different ways. I think because yeah. I was I got good grades. I got it done because I wanted to play sports, but. I'm with you where I was like, I couldn't fundamentally understand why this adult was telling me what to do. Like, because I, I would do the work, I would do this, but it didn't, personality or genetics or whatever, I didn't get like why they were telling me what to do. And so I didn't feel the need to subscribe. And that kind of explains oh, why totally we're here. I totally didn't subscribe. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So, but I was still a good student. I watched documentaries. I was just learning in my own way. You found a good why though. Yeah. That you said it. You said, well, why? Because I wanted to do sports. You yeah. found your why. Yeah. I think that's also really important 100%. to keep going. 100%. Um, you know, even with avant-garde, I get all excited and this and that. But there are those days where I'm like, why? Yeah. <laughs> why again? It is oh, so. Well, so tell us, tell us the details <laughs> about how you started it and why. Like, give. I know, I mean, yeah. you said you're two years in now full time. Um, so we oh, five founded. We, yes. So we founded August 2021. Okay. Um, and really, I wanted a place of, for me uh, to be able to work in the arts. Um, I couldn't find a place. I also wanted to volunteer in my community. I, it was during the pan, you know, it was like pandemic era. So like yeah. everybody was volunteering or we, no one could volunteer. And so I just started to create this idea that I had been sitting on for a couple of years of, you know, oh, I really wanted to create, you know, like a think tank um, experience share, like curated group of artists that can really like, 
help each other grow. How do I make that happen? But then I also wanted to do like a TED Talk style, like artistry, like break, you know, disrupt the whole like artist talk hey. thing. Um, and I just needed to find a place to be able to umbrella that under. And so as a creator, I created an avant or a, a nonprofit that we could actually funnel government funding, sponsorship money, and not necessarily have to sell anything to be able to create a place for artists to be supported. Yeah. Um, you know, we have public art and everyone enjoys it, but the artists that create it are struggling. Yeah. Um, and I feel like that's a huge disconnect. I think that instead of taking money from the artists, we really should funnel those public funding for the public arts back into the people who create it. And if we really want that to be sustainable for our to beautification of our city, who is it that we need to sustain in order to continue that? And we, ha I don't see that happening yet. So tell me a little about the system. So if somebody donates, I'm not familiar with this space at all. Obviously, I love art and I love the creative stuff. I remember like the ceramic animals, they like different states did different things. I think we were the okay. cow. I can't yeah. remember. I don't know. <laughs> I was some like a nationwide initiative. Uh, but you see these, I, I know we got the MLK big piece of art. Like that was some news. So the, they pay the artists, oh. it's there. And then like, that's it. Like, what is the system? Yeah. So the system is just grants. So okay. there's no, um, but they pay the artists and for the materials. They pay the, the artists. Time, they assuming. pay the artists. Okay. Materials, cost, time, labor, but but it's all up to the artist to budget that out. It's up to the artist to acquire the funding to propose the entire project. Okay. The entire administration work behind this money is on the artist. Okay. So there's really no like business administration support. They're just like, you have to work for it, um, which, you know, we get that, but. But if it's a system you don't know, you need some sort of consultation on like, this is how you present it, or this is how you, the amount of materials you need. Like even budgeting has got to be hard. It's never been created before. So you don't really know. No. Okay. It's everyone's winging it, you know, yeah. and the system that has created these processes don't really have a great intuitive uh, user friendly process for these artists to go through the projects that you're mentioning. I'm pretty sure they were probably funded by the National Endowment of the Arts. OK. In order to get money from them, it's a very highly competitive process and it's a very like bureaucratic administrative process. Mm -hmm. Their system and their platforms are so outdated. It's like you're working on. Um, S Do you remember what what is it? M MS DOS. Oh, DOS yeah. S DOS. Oh, or my whatever. gosh. Yeah. It's like that. Wow. It's really bad. Um, it's so it's really hard. It consumes a lot of your time. You're not actually making art. You are also not educated on how to do this either because it's a whole like it's like doing taxes, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, but and then uh, speaking of taxes, they give them this grant money, but then they have to actually pay taxes on it. They have to. There's no support or education or guidance or. Ed this is all like just from scratch. They're just giving them money so right. that they don't have to do the back end work of the administration. And it's all up to these artists that probably don't have a formal education. They don't have a business, you know, administration degree. Uh, so the money is out there. Yeah. Everyone says there's money out there for the arts. That's why, because no one's able to actually access it. Okay. Okay. So, so they can come to you guys and you guys can help facilitate that process. What we are trying to do with that is we are actually trying to get the money from that process. Okay. And allow this organization to create jobs, projects, platforms, um, events, and basically just take that money and disperse it through other avenues than just like making them work for it. Right. Okay. So if an artist comes to you, what is like a step one? Um, so let's see. There's different avenues in the way that we take artists. Okay. We have a membership application program where we have marketing resources, funding resources, um, administrative support. We have a salon program that's curating towards 
uh, like a small group of artists that then come together. We create the curriculum. We train them on this program. There's So that's our membership program. That is only $30 a month. Hey, let's go. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, and, you know, we're new. So get in now because that $30 isn't going to last, you right. know, the next five to 10 years. But we really want to get this started so that people can understand the value of having those services provided to them. Right. Um, rather than just giving them money and then figure it out. Right. Um, we want to provide more than that. Well, and on top of that, you get a community. I think that was the biggest thing that I didn't have starting out again 20 plus years ago. I sort of knew other people are doing uh, entrepreneurship, but not really. And I lucked out having, you know, entrepreneurial mindset and parents and stuff like that. But I didn't have a community. So I, and you're on an island when you're doing this by yourself. Like it's it's a lot of alone time and you just don't know. And this was before Instagram and all that, YouTube even. Um, but now having in real life humans to work with and have a network and like vibe off each other's pro tips is a big thing. That's huge. It's so huge. Actually sitting down, having a coffee with someone who's in your industry and as a peer and can give you a real life advice and experience right. where can you go and get that right so and and i do it every day you and i have talked yeah. about that and i have been cultivating that a lot but it still is not so easy yeah. you know it's it's a lot of uh boots on the ground you know asking those questions like you know, knocking on doors, really. Yeah. Um, but we want we're we're creating currently. You know, we have programming that's open to the public, ticketed events. Um, artists can submit to any of our events that are you know su uh, displaying gallery work. We have her story, which is an all women exhibit. We have their story that is geared towards the LGBTQIA plus community. Um, we also have sustainable couture, which is geared towards the sustainability of like the clothing industry, fashion industry. We take donations all year long, hey. um, clothing donations, uh, DM us, email us, info at avantgarde.org. Um, and we upcycle that into art. We raise money for the arts. And then after that, any excess clothing we give to um, our unhoused neighbors, whether it's through the mission or habits, um, mutiny cafe. Okay. Um, we know a lot of organizations and we, we try to switch it up every year so that we can donate not just to one, but a few so that, you know, resource ex or, uh, what is it? D diversify the resources. Yeah, yes. I was actually a perfect segue. I was going to say, and um, being from Colorado, we're talking a little, little bit uh, about this before we got on the mic, but the diversity and lack thereof. Mm. Uh, how intentional are you about diversity and inclusion? And why is like representation such an important piece to you? Um, you know, really, we see uh, diversity and inclusion. We try to look at it as though who is not represented in the room and how can we get them in the room? Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether that's cold outreach, which is usually our our approach is we cultivate and curate specific people to come into our events, especially if we're not getting the outcome from our call or submissions. We really try to include a diverse lineup. Um, one of our events we have you know, a, a white male, a black male. Now we're looking for a female either, you know, of color or in the LGBT community. You know, we want to make sure that the voices that we're representing or in our programming sure. are a diverse voice. We don't want the same voice to be heard every time you see a new person walk up there. That's awesome. Um, so we do. We, you know, we are really big on DEI um, diversity training with our board of directors, with the people that work with us. Um, and they're coached to make sure that we are intentionally reaching out to anyone who is underrepresented in our community, in our lineup, in our programming. That's awesome. And I think it's what's, your, your timing is really great because we're getting a lot of these larger corporations and um, just bigger like, traditional, you know, big money situations really caring about activating into niche communities, diversity, and inclusion, women initiatives. It's, it's great. So there are funds available. Are there any strategic partners that you're, you don't have to say the names, but that you're excited about right now that you're going to be working with because like the timing and the landscape of our world is like on time? Um, you know, I don't have anybody on deck, but I would love to yeah. work with those funder funders, investors. Yeah, absolutely. We want to make sure that 
we're being seen and heard in all avenues, regardless of history. Yeah. We, we need to make it, you know, we need to make those avenues and really, you know, I, there's a, con- you know, it's a controversial topic about corporations getting involved and really buying into that. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you really have to take up the space that's offered. We can't change those spaces if we don't get into them. I completely agree. And that, well, I have, we have not seen sponsors on turmeric and tea. You really haven't seen a lot of sponsors, even on my personal social media, because I've kept it very coming from that space. I wanted to keep it very tight, very pure and having sensitive conversations. It was never about monetizing the conversation or anything like that. That being said, as we get really intentional and keep our hands on like contractual agreements and the way things are processed and, and our art and our situation, there's great avenues, you know, with more money, more funding, you can reach more voices. You can do bigger things. You, I, my piece and opinion is you just have to be really hands-on. You have to be very intentional about who you work with, why, and then very clear on expectation, how that moves forward. Um, And I would say to any organization, play the long game. Like as long as you can do it the right way and hang in there, I know you got to get paid. We all have to pay bills, but take the time to get intentional about who you work with, who you partner with, get to know them, and then facilitate a really mutual beneficial relationship for that long term right. because we're in a society now where it's not just like paper post and do this of course that still happens but there's situations and people that really want to connect with the human and the cause and stay in it right. and be in it and be part of the journey right um reflect who you want to work with 100 percent. you know if you want them to be researched you want them to know what's going on you want to know they that they know your background do the same as well. Yeah. Make sure you know who you're working with. Invest that time because that investment is back on you, yeah. not necessarily them. You know? Absolutely. Well, you can't. I tell this to like influencers who worked a long time. I'm like, it's more, you know, if you're getting big checks from big companies, that's fine. But you understand they can rebrand and redo in a minute. If you have a hundred post signs in your yard that's now flooded that your audience can't see or now right. they reflected bad on you, it's way harder for you to rebrand or untell a story or unsee something than it is for these big dogs. You have to be hyper protective of what it is you're representing and doing yeah yeah be protective of your brand and what you've created and it's going to be really important i think in our society coming up your passions the things that really touch you personally your heart uh that's what's gonna be what we are after um you know these uh production jobs i don't know how to really say it correctly but AI is taking over. Yeah. You know, and yeah. and for better or for worse, we'll be able to be pushed into our passions mm-hmm. um, and really take on the unique factors of who we are. Mm-hmm. Your truth. And yeah. like you really authenticity. That. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so that's a good question. Then why? Because I asked you, I think this on the phone. These are these are this is a hard path to travel. I mean, you could have just, you know, got a paycheck, lived your life, built a family or, you know travel to band around the world, whatever the heart called. Yeah. Um, why is this so important to you personally, facilitating this organization and this mission? Freedom. Yeah. Freedom of choice, uh, of, you know, setting a new precedent. Um, I think this was also being worked, avant-garde was also being dug out and worked on during a time where, you know, uh, the way that you're treated in a workplace really matters. Uh, the employee should should be able to not have to choose between work and their personal life. Mm-hmm. Um, I really did enjoy that about my you know previous position, and I have a I took on an intern, and I have a volunteer event producer, and I tell them you know by all means like if you need to go do take care of fix whatever like we'll be here you know um because i don't think that i want to avant-garde and a place for myself to be accepted come as i am you know all of that and and it be true yeah um i think a lot of places preach that but they don't actually show that yeah and as much as i want you know work to be done i think that our focus on mental health 
on us being creators, it's a lot more than just the physical manifestation of the work that we do. Absolutely. Well, you look into like marketing or art or whatever it is, these are like constant messages that are coming at us. So as marketer, as creator, as leader, is there's a heavy responsibility on us to be very intentional that, about that because it's not just about the art. It's how that art impacts people. It's how those people walk through the world and impact their crew of people. Like the ripple effect is so huge that if you can get like the leaders or the influencers, the conscious ones together to live in conscious space, that flickers out to everything that Sets they're the around. Tone. Oh yeah. my gosh. Yeah. Um, and we are, we are setting a tone for the next, you know, five to 10 years of mm-hmm. our society of this is what our main focus is, is of passion, our creations, you know, what is it our uniqueness can really bring to society. And I think that's going to be a really long lasting uh, impact on society from the pandemic from you know that really I think that's a whole nother conversation (laughs) (laughs) but yeah I think things are changing and I think this is where we're headed and I think that's also part of why avant-garde has sprung up not just because I wanted it but because it's something that's being pushed we're being pushed towards yeah society's ready I I know it's still it's a I mean you're cutting down weeds you're bullies in a trail but it's there's acceptance there's there's possibility out there and it's it's ready tell us about some of the big events that are coming up or what's what's on the what's on the agenda (laughs) like hit us Uh, with it so let's see uh this coming month, February, we have a professional development event, Artist Lens and Lounge. We take headshots, profile, LinkedIn profile, photos, whatever you want. Bring it to the photo shoot and we will regurgitate those photos for artists, uh, business owners, entrepreneurs, anyone okay. who wants to come. Um, it's $10 a ticket. So oh, it's okay. donated right back into the community to further the programming. Um, in March, we have Her Story uh, we're still shopping for a venue. So if anyone wants her story at their place, let us know. Uh, and then we have their story this summer. We have sustainable couture in the fall. Um, but keep a lookout, avantgarde.org. Okay. And that's A-V-A-N-T-E-G-A-R-D-E dot org to find all of our events, our blog. We have an international blog with all of uh, the artists that are out there, they're contemporary artists that we introduce to our community um, across the world. We've got a Ukrainian artist on there. Oh, We've got cool. a Russian artist, a couple Russian artists, actually, that okay. reach back out. They're really amazing. That's, I think, the biggest thing about avant-garde is connecting everyone's voices yeah. of the people. Yeah. Because eventually avant-garde is going to be a global impact, not just a local impact. That's what's up. Well, and it's so beautiful that if you don't speak the same language, I mean, art can be like a universal language. I'm very passionate about music. I think I told you I wanted to build a choir. Oh, yeah. I talk about it all the time, which is very random because we have zero musical experience outside of just <laughs> loving music and watching Sister Act a Ooh. million times. Mm-hmm. That's my deep education there. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it, I mean, these are like u- athletics, music, cooking, like art. All this is such universal language and it can unite without, with language barriers or um, land, I mean, being far away, like anything. I mean, it can totally. unite and damn, our world needs nothing more than unity at this point yeah. and understanding. And why not back projects that yeah. will actually speak for us yeah. throughout the entire world? So we've got dreams. We'll be here. We'll That's be here. Yeah. Well, that kind of leads to my next question. Well, it's two different questions, but maybe it's one. I was going to say, um, where do you see avant-garde in a couple years or maybe 10 years? And then what is success to you? I'm guessing those are probably two questions that are with similar answers yes um let's see so for the next two years i really want to scale up i want the organization to employ artists locally and i want that to really just turn out so you know scale and grow and maybe hopefully hire on two people every year um until maybe we're into like the hundreds uh you know really build out the events projects, funding, programming. I think we can, sky's the limit at this point with the the things that we can do with this nonprofit. You know, five to 10 years, I really want to branch out nationwide, at least two, three, you know, uh, America's chapters and possibly some global chapters. Okay. Um, you know, I know a few people who are in the nonprofit sector. If we could get a hold of their like work ethic and drive, they have global ties that we could potentially you know, tap into global funding and global projects and potentially collaborate on a global level um, within the same organization. And then it become this like 
niche network that every artist needs to join to be a part of a global movement. There you go. You heard it here first. On to work and tequila. Um, I love that. What? So the artists right now, we kind of talked about how like the community is a little bit disconnected. What's like something like if an artist is showing up, they want to get more connected. Like what's like a mindset you would suggest for artists that are new in the game that want to take this on full time? I would say get out there, go to the markets, go to the events. Definitely utilize any free event. If you can just walk up, those are your your bang for your buck. Yeah. Um, and just start, you know, introducing yourself to every vendor out there. Every vendor is an artist, a peer, a, a potential collaborator. And, you know, collaborations, that's where it leads to cash yeah. and finance and money. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, really creating things first and selling second is how a lot of things are done in the industry anyways. Mm-hmm. Um, so get together, combine your your superpowers, and, you know, put your voice out there. I love it. And there's such a disconnect in color in general. That's why I kind of focus on the creative situation. How do we, how do we, like, as an audience that's not directly connected to the art world, I do try, but how are people finding out about you guys and yeah. what's going on? I don't feel like the arts are really promoted or talked about, or maybe I'm disconnected, but what's a good way to tap in in general if you're on the outside looking in? Oh, man. Uh, start with Denver Arts arts and Venues. Okay. They're connected to a lot of organizations. They fund a lot of organizations. Um, and then trickle down from there. Get linked into their Instagram a lot of uh, the local art organizations were all connected to each other. Yeah. Uh, Aurora has a really great arts district, Rhino's Arts District, uh, Santa Fe Art District. Just Google like Denver Art District okay. and start attending those events. Pick up some business cards, get into their Instagram. From there, everybody knows everybody. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, you you just need three new Instagram handles to follow right. or three new art districts to follow. And that's it. You're in. So yeah. I, I think that's amazing. I've done a few things, crush walls, and we do performances and all oh, yeah. that stuff. Uh, but it's still kind of hard to tap in. But we'll we follow you, obviously. So yes. we'll stay connected. Tons What's of local on? artists. Yeah. Please uh, scour our followers. We've got photographers, visual artists, ceramics, performance artists. Um, we, you know, all of our followers go to our followers. <laughs> there you go. Just give, some, give them some support. What is last question? What is success to you personally? You know, success would be seeing a lot more artists having full time art jobs, Mm -hmm. you know, not just full time side gigs. Mm -hmm. I think that we have a great potential here in Colorado, in Denver, to employ artists full time and really create that art that we're always enjoying. Yeah, there's art always being created here, but there's no full time employment. Oh, man. And I would incre- or encourage individuals to find your creative street because we're all creators as human beings, mm-hmm. whether it's drawing or art or, and people are like, well, I'm not good at what it doesn't matter. Like, just go create clay or something because there's if probably something not, you did as a kid. You better start. It yeah. is intuitively inside of you the need to create. It's so healing. Go get a paintbrush, go get some crayons, get a coloring book. I was going to say a coloring book's even a good start. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, go get a go to your local rec center. I bet you they have some craft art gym is a great place. Um, wine and painting. Wine, the and wine will painting, get you there. Support local <laughs> artists. <laughs> there you go. Well, I appreciate your time and energy. I love the vision. I love that it's coming out of Denver. I love that it's a woman, a woman of color. Uh, we're putting Denver on the map and you have big global desires. I think that's big. So go check out all the things Amanda has going on, the community that surrounds her, the energy, adapt the this abundance and collaborative mindset. I think that's good regardless of what any, any industry you're in. Uh, and let's support our local heroes. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You're amazing. Hey, Your platform's you. amazing. Uh, women are amazing. <laughs> we try. We try. One day at a time. Oh, man. my God. Right I've worked with so many women today. It's it's wild. So we're out here. Yeah, we're, we're uh, kicking and grooving and doing the things. Doing the things. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your time and energy. And we'll see you at an event soon. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining Turmeric and Tequila with your host, Kristen Olson. Tune in next time and don't forget to subscribe on Apple, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen.